Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you all for being here. Got to see some familiar faces, see some new people too. This is very good. And uh, again, I'm very happy to be here at, at uh, UMass Amherst. As Jackie mentioned, I was here, uh, it was back in June, right? We had a start to finish FSL course just over in that room over there. Brings back some memories. And like she said, I'm now at Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I'd actually like to take a few minutes at the beginning here to talk a little bit about what I do and what my, my role there is, because it might be relevant to you. It also might not be, but <laughs> whatever, it's okay. It's, it's almost like in my job description now that I have to promote Michigan and, and what I do. I enjoy doing it, don't get me wrong. Oh, and before I start, I should also mention, I am wearing a microphone. This is all being recorded. This is for a few reasons. This is so that if, let's say, you couldn't make it tomorrow because you get sick or something, you can still go back and get it. It'll be, it'll be uh, on my channel, and I'll send out the link afterwards. Uh, secondly, also be aware, it is recording everything, so be careful <laughs> with what you say. I just do that as a disclaimer. Uh, you know, I, I do post-processing. I edit stuff out, so, you know, that's no big deal. But I haven't had a problem yet. It's, uh, I can't think of what anybody would say. But um, it's something I've been doing in the past few months or so. Anytime I give a workshop, anytime I give a talk, just so that I keep a record of, of what I do. Now, the, the first couple of hours today, I'm, I'm going to be giving some lectures on functional connectivity and also graph theory. But like I said, I wanted to, to just take a few minutes here to talk about what I'm doing right now. And at Michigan, I'm part of this thing called the Neural Imaging Initiative, or NII, which I thought was kind of cute. It's a common extension. And this is it's a collaboration between researchers at Michigan. And the point of it is anybody at Michigan who collects any kind of neural imaging data off the scanner. So fMRI, structural, diffusion, anything. If you have a grant and you're collecting data off that scanner, you are entitled to consulting help. So I'm part of this group. There's, there's me, there's a couple of uh, computer scientists who are more on the technical side of things who will give advice about designing an experiment, analyzing the data, and keeping people up to date for, for new tools. So it's for anybody who does neuroimaging, any of these modalities. And a lot of what I do is, uh, I'll, I'll do things exactly like this. So every one to two months, again, I've just started, but that's kind of the schedule I've been on. I'll give a workshop on a new technique, a new toolbox, something that may be relevant to the field. Because the whole reason this thing started was maybe a year and a half ago, two years. Anybody remember that Eklund 2016 paper? Anybody not know what I'm talking about? Eklund 2016. Okay, well, this, this was uh, a very provocative, let's say, article that uh, critiqued some of the methods of how we report results that are corrected for false positives. Yeah, yeah. And when this thing came out, you know, obviously a lot of people were you know, talking about it, but they had this huge discussion at Michigan because there's so many different researchers from different departments, you know, psychiatry, basic research, the hospital, and they're all asking, is this a problem? Uh, is it a problem for me, for my lab? And if it is, what, if anything, do I do about it? And so they decided, well, wouldn't it be convenient if we had somebody who was full-time dedicated to keep up with this to give some kind of, you know, reasoned judgment about what should be done about it, if anything. So that's really what I do. And as far as traveling around teaching, these guys are great because they will allow me time to do this. Because I record it, because you know, it's about new toolboxes, new techniques, it still helps them out. So it's really no imposition. It's not like I can be gone all the time, obviously. But like, for example, a few weeks ago, I was in Milwaukee. We had to start to finish Apne workshop. So if you're interested, that's all online, all the code. Uh, everything in the Dropbox folder. And by the way, everybody got the link to the Dropbox folder? Anybody not get the link? Oh, okay. Um, after this, we'll, we'll take a little break after this first lecture, then I'll make sure that you get it. Um, 
it has all the slides I'm using, it has all the data we'll be using, processed at different parts. I'm hoping that as we go through today, we'll be able to get a sense of how long individual steps take. But when we get to uh, the next day, if you are unable to process the entire NYU data set overnight, that's fine. You can just download it. And I also have an external hard drive if you need that data as well. But the NAI, you know, feel free to talk to me about that. Uh, you know, during lunch or something, I'm, I'm happy to. It's, I think it's a really good idea. And the last thing, I, I swear, is I'm going to throw out a plug for the Michigan fMRI course, which some people have heard about. This takes place every August. It's a two-week course, eight hours a day. It's very intensive. I helped out with this past one just a couple months ago. And it's a start-to-finish uh, fMRI course. They primarily use SPM. They cover a lot of stuff as well. They cover you know, the physics. They cover different topics like diffusion-weighted imaging, machine learning, other things as well. First half of the day is lectures from a bunch of different people. They fly some people in. And second half of the day is, is labs. And I'll be helping out with that. Deadline is January 15th. They accept, I think, 60 people total out of I forget how many hundreds they get, but it's quite a bit. So, you know, check it out. You can just Google fMRI course Michigan, and you should see the application. Okay, at this point, I am going to briefly review the schedule just so we have a roadmap of what we're doing over the next two days. Um, I'm hoping everybody's MATLAB works, the con toolbox works. If any of that didn't work, talk to me during lunch because after lunch is when we are really going to get into the practical side of things. So if that isn't working, it's, it's going to be really difficult to follow along. But uh, I think it's pretty straightforward. Like I said, there was one version of MATLAB, 2017B, which has problems with SPM. So if you have that, I recommend installing something, either the most recent one or something earlier. Uh, so Con Toolbox, pretty easy to download, just set the path. And then the data set we're going to be using is the NYU test retest experiment. Day one, uh, as opposed to what we did back in June, this is going to be a little less focused on the lectures, more focused on the practical side of things. This is primarily about a toolbox. And as I'll be showing, the, the theory behind both functional connectivity, graph theory, there are a lot of details. There's a lot of complicated stuff in there for sure. But the basics are actually pretty straightforward. And with functional connectivity, at least, it's conceptually, it's, it's pretty simple. And I'll show you why in a, a little bit. But the first two hours, it's going to be a review of functional connectivity, overview of graph theory, just so we know what the con toolbox is doing. And then we work on an individual subject. We do some quality assurance. And at the end of the day, I'm you know, going to go around and make sure everybody is you know, both caught up with everything we've done and also making sure you can start doing your own pre-processing of the entire data set. You know, I hope that you can leave it running overnight. Like I said, no big problem if you can't. I have it for you. But you'll have the whole thing analyzed on your machine. You know it works, and you know you can do all the steps. For day two, yeah, we continue with some more practical stuff. We do group level analysis. We, we look at the very, very, very good figure generating programs in the contour box, which I think is its biggest strength. And one thing I want to bring to your attention, initially I was going to have a small separate session on scripting the analysis. The more I thought about it, the more I thought I don't actually do this because the contour box, the graphical user interface is so good there's really not a lot of need to do the actual scripting as you would in, say, FSL or AFNI or something like that. That being said, you can do it. I'll speak to it a little bit, but I'm probably going to fold that into more of the morning lecture and then try to leave the afternoon free for um, more individual assistance for analyzing your own data. Yeah. Sound good? OK. Let's move on to functional connectivity. 
Now, functional connectivity is an interesting history. Um, you know, MRI had been around for, for a while. They'd been developing it, especially through the 80s is when it became very, very popular. They started to get some of the, the hardware down, some of the sequences down, and it became more and more practical to get very high quality scans of individual organs. They were using this mainly for you know, diagnosing things like cancerous tissue in the liver, brain, what have you. Now, when they started getting into fMRI, it started to pick up late 80s, early 90s, then they found out we can start to actually map what the functional activity looks like over time as they're doing a task. So flash a checkerboard, gets visual activation, tap a button, get motor activation, they're just mapping out all the primary areas. So, you know, there are a lot of research and clinical applications for that, but in the mid-90s, what was found, oh, and I'll give a functional connectivity demo later on just to show you what's going on, but back in 1995, there was this kind of odd experiment conducted by a man named Bharat Biswal. This was the origin of functional connectivity. And whereas everybody in the early 90s was very excited and very focused about mapping out the function of the brain. So what part of the brain is involved in motor, involved in visual, and maybe we can start to do some more advanced stuff. What Biswal did is he said, well, what if we just put somebody in the scanner and we have them do absolutely nothing? Which, according to, he wrote a history about this and it sounds pretty dramatic. I don't, I don't know how exaggerated it is, but it seemed like everybody thought he was nuts, that he wanted to do this. You know, why, wh what, what possibly could you learn if the person is doing absolutely nothing? But what he showed is that if you have, say, on the left, the, uh, some kind of task where you have something simple like motor activity, so they're pressing left buttons, they're pressing right buttons, and lo and behold, you're getting motor activity in both the left and right motor cortices. If during a scan where there's absolutely nothing going on, you place what's called a seed region, okay? So you take uh, a cluster of voxels, so voxels are smallest spatial resolution element. It's like, a, it's like if you imagine the entire brain as a giant Rubik's cube, the voxels are the smaller cubes, and we're recording from them over time. You can take that seed region and you can correlate that with every other voxel in the brain. And if you do that, lo and behold, you get a very similar pattern to what you see with the actual task activity. So we looked at this, he said, well, isn't this interesting? Does that mean that even when people are not doing certain tasks, parts of the brain are still communicating somehow with each other? Which makes sense, obviously, even if we is there any such thing as true rest? You know, probably not. But even so, when somebody's not explicitly doing a task, there still seem to be connections or, say, networks between different nodes of the brain. And nodes is something that's going to come up again and again in graph theory and again and again in the con toolbox. Because we can start to categorize these things as networks. Right, and so we found several different networks. We found you know, the motor network, the visual network, the default mode network, many different ones. And different ones are being discovered every day. Not really. Here's what a typical time series looks like. So if we take a seed, again, a small, we average across a bunch of voxels, and say the posterior cingulate cortex, right? This thing right here, this co-activation between this posterior region of the brain and this anterior region of the brain, this is the classic default mode network. Okay, you'll, you'll come across this again and again. People use this in research all the time. They use it for diagnostics. They use it for clinical research as well. And let's trace that out in, say, orange. Right? Now, if we have another C in some place like the intraparietal sulcus, right? and you plot out what the time course looks there, you can see that some of these networks interact with each other in the sense that they're anti-correlated. Right? Some networks are correlated, some are anti-correlated. And from this, people have used functional connectivity to infer 
that when someone networks are on, they seem to suppress or they seem to switch the majority of activity from one set of nodes or one network to another. So that was a study by Fox, Michael Fox and his colleagues, back in 2005. And over the past couple of decades, they've really started to refine functional connectivity and what you can use it for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I'm not going to get too much into the the, the generation of the the, the MRS signal, um, but most of what you need to know is that when somebody's in a magnet, we're primarily getting signal from the hydrogen protons that are attached to the wire. So if this is, uh, if you know all this already, that's fine. Okay, you do, okay. Is anybody, is anybody new to all that MR physics and everything? Okay, good, okay. Then, yeah, I, I won't retread all that. But yeah, it's pr usually what they do, they, they scale the total activity to make it relative to, say, 100. So that any deflections from that is a percent signal change. Yeah. So that's functional connectivity. Very, very simple. We have two time courses, and we do a simple correlation between the two. That's really all it is, if I had to, to summarize it. Nothing too fancy there. It's really not that sophisticated. And because we're not convolving the bold response, we're not doing any kind of task design. We don't need to worry about jitter. We don't need to worry about collinearity. So very, very simple. But as you'll see, it can get very, very sophisticated. So that's one type of connectivity that's probably the most popular one right now. A couple other ones you should be aware of. Obviously, there's structural connectivity, which refers to the actual uh, you know, structural links between uh, functionally and anatomically distinct regions. Has anybody here dissected a brain in a lab? OK, great. It's, it's a great exercise. Uh, very, very informative. And I don't recommend you do this, but if you did, if you, say, took your fingernail and you <laughs> dug in there and you started to peel it apart, you'd find that it, in general, it has preferred tear directions, kind of like string cheese, right? So I haven't seen anybody do this, but I heard this from an MR physicist, so it must be true, right? <laughs> but the point is, the, the brain has these very strong, uh, dense white matter bundles, right? They have these major white matter tracks that connect functionally and structurally distinct parts of the brain. One, one common one I see tossed around a lot, I think, uh, if I remember, the arcuate fasciculus, which connects like the, this inferior frontal areas and uh, more, more posterior areas. And roughly, people think it matches on to, say, Broca's area and Wernicke's area both necessary for language comprehension and production. So if you sever that connection, but you didn't actually lesion those cortical areas, presumably you'd get some kind of processing deficit in speech production and, and uh, comprehension. Right? Uh, if this thing is severed? Oh, I didn't know that. Good to know. Um, I won't be talking too much about structural connectivity. Uh, be aware that more advanced techniques try to combine the two to constrain functional connectivity. I'm giving a, a series of lectures on MR tricks at Michigan. Just so you know, I've given a couple uh, so far. It's a really useful tool. And they, they have this thing called anatomically constrained tractography. So if you're looking at connections between different areas, it tries to constrain that by saying, well, this is more biologically plausible because the direction should only go in this area and not, say, go at a, a sudden angle. It shouldn't go into ventricles. It shouldn't go into places where it shouldn't. Sorry, you said it was MRI tricks. MR tricks, yeah. Really, really useful toolbox. Um, they make some very good arguments for why their approach gets over this thing called the crossing fibers problem. Um, so last time I was here, I talked about TBSS briefly for, for DTI analysis. But uh, I'm more and more leaning towards using MR tricks. And it's pretty simple to use, too. So um, again, that's all being uh, uploaded if you want to look at it later. 
And lastly, one type of connectivity you should be aware of is something called effective connectivity. It's a little bit more complicated. We're not going to get into it today. This comes mainly out of Carl Friston's group. They were the ones who laid the theoretical foundation for it. And uh, to put this in very simplified terms, you are trying to make claims about the directionality of activity. So does activity in one particular node, one region, one seed, I'm using those things interchangeably, by the way, for the purposes of today. Does that have a direct causal effect on what the activity is in another region? So you specify these models about what you think the nodes are, what you think the direction is, and then you compare that against a competing model. You derive some kind of Bayes criterion and use that to say that, yes, there is some directionality there. I've only tried using it once, didn't get that far with it. I can't say too much about it, but it does exist. Some papers do publish with it. Some people have a problem with it. They think you can't win that much just comparing two models. Maybe they're both really bad, but just one's better than the other. Um, fair enough, but I haven't got that much into it. Yeah, yeah, th yeah. They're they're trying to to say that um, this will allow you to say one region causes act this kind of activity pattern in another region. Yeah. Surprisingly, or not surprisingly, uh, it seems like most of the papers on effective connectivity come out of Frisson's lab or people associated with him. Um, I'm hoping it you know it seems to be getting more widespread uh, use. But if you want to know about it, you know, definitely go back to their papers. Okay. So we know what functional connectivity is. It's correlations and time series between two or more different areas. Now, a few words about how we pre-process this. Because you have control over this in the contour box. Even if you don't use the Con Toolbox, even if you use some other software for, for doing it, you're going to have to think about whether you want to use some of these steps. Uh, the major difference between resting state preprocessing and task-related preprocessing, very similar. A lot of the steps, a lot of the concepts behind it are the same. You, know, you want to clean up the data as much as possible, obviously. We want to remove any possible confounds. So if you can remove physiological confounds, uh, get rid of motion confounds, you usually want to normalize it to some template. You want to smooth it and so on. But the major difference between them is that functional connectivity processing has much more stringent motion cutoffs. With task loaded data, these days, most packages, they give you an option to set some threshold. So if between one volume and another volume, there's motion exceeding this threshold, you have some options. Do you want to totally remove the volume? Usually that has problems. You can uh, take that volume and put it in your model as a separate regressor to account for that. But basically, you flag it, and you determine what to do with it. The reason it's so much more stringent in functional connectivity, in resting state, is that unlike task activity, we are looking at you know, one voxel, one seed connected with the entire brain. So if there's any motion at just one time point, that can have a serious effect on the strength of your entire correlation. Right? With task related activity, motion is still a big problem, obviously. But if we have it at one time point, that's not even when we're Analyzing a certain condition, you know, how much do you really care about that? But the thing is, we're using the whole time series here, so that affects the whole thing that we're analyzing. We're going to go over, in the practical, a few different ways to uh, do motion scrubbing. So I say deleting volumes. What does this mean? You could remove the entire volume and just pretend like it never existed. 
Now, why is that a problem? We also need to have an accurate estimate of what the temporal autocorrelation is of the entire time series. This is important for things like estimating degrees of freedom and having valid statistical tests. So just removing it, acting like it never existed, not usually the best idea. Uh, another way, and the default in contour box and the way that most people recommend, is to have a threshold. If the motion is above that threshold, take that volume and use it as uh, an additional regressor in your model. So any variance associated with that motion is going to be soaked up by that regressor and should be taken out of the actual time series you're looking at. To determine yeah, you know, how much or what kind of metric you should use to, to flag one of these, the most popular one these days that I've seen is something called frame-wise displacement. I forget the exact formula, but it's some kind of mathematical compression summary of all of the different motion parameters. So if I move in the x direction, y direction, and z direction, yeah. We can take all that at each time point. We can, I, th I forget if they squared or, or something. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a single number for that volume. I should have asked this before, but has everybody here analyzed fMRI data at some point? Has anybody not? So Parker, you haven't. Irina, you haven't. OK. Um, if this isn't news to you, just let me know. But one thing you'll be doing when you're doing your, uh, your pre-processing, you're going to be looking at some motion graphs. It shows over the entire time series. So yeah, OK. So how much it changed. Usually, you get six parameters, so there's the translations, there's the rotations. Uh, Frame-wise displacement just compresses all of that into one number. And DVAR is pretty similar for, for all intents and purposes, pretty much the same as FD, frame-wise displacement. That's the root mean square change in the bold signal between volumes. So there's a couple things going on. There's the actual uh, motion that we detect. There's also sudden changes in global signal. Okay, sometimes this is, this is an actual hardware artifact. Sometimes it seems to happen spontaneously. When I'm talking about sudden changes in global signal, I'm talking about large changes in intensity over the entire brain that are probably not due to blood flow changes for whatever reason. I, I don't know the exact basis of them. But we can detect when those come up come up. It could be, say, two, three standard deviations above the mean signal. We flag that, and we also treat that as a problem volume. Any questions about this so far? Everything else, normalization, slice time and correction, I'm going to assume it's the same as task. Yeah. Yeah, yes, that's another good point. And they also try to include regressors that account for these drifts over time. So traditional motion correction is going to correct for you know volume to volume displacement. But if you also include a regressor that, uh, oh, I thought that was Jen Jennifer. Uh, if you also include a regressor that includes say the entire drift over time, it'll try to also account for that as well. You can get really complicated. Uh, you know, these days it's almost the standard to also include the uh, derivative of the motion. The reason that is is because when somebody moves, they're usually not just moving like that, right? <laughs> right? Okay. Yeah. It's not. Uh, it's not Saturday Fever. It's. It's more. They kind of move like this. So it's a combination of translations, rotations. It's not that clean. So if you include the derivative, you can try to account for these more complex uh, motions. Yeah. 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 So Khan has its own artifact detection toolbox. We'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, as you'll see, Khan can call upon 
external programs like, uh, like ART, the Artifact Detection Toolbox. It's its own toolbox. It, it, it does things like this, you know, DVARs and things like that. And it, it shows you a graphical summary of uh, which volumes are a problem. But it also likes to do its, its own thing. Yeah, so you have options. We'll, we'll just be using the default con tools. Yeah, you have an option. So con is very tightly linked to SPM. So if you haven't done any pre-processing, con will, will call upon SPM to do all these different steps. If you've already pre-processed it outside of con, that's OK, too. Uh, there is an option to say, I've already pre-processed this. Just run the denoising and just run the, the connectivity. Oh, that's that's a good point. I haven't looked at that. Yeah. So the question, just in case this didn't get picked up. So the question was, um, why not use say like a sliding window that might be more robust to, to say global changes in the the entire time series. Uh, I don't know if if Khan does that. Yeah. But it's it's a good idea. I'm sure some people have done it at some point. All right. There's something else you should be aware of. This was a big debate, say, mid to late 2000s. And it's about something called global signal regression, or GSR. Now, I told you about you know sudden changes in the entire global signal, right? So that's the entire activity summed over the entire brain. So you can also plot that. You can just take the average activity, time point one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on for your whole time series. The reason some people recommended including this is that they, they hypothesized that some of these global signal changes were related to, say, physiological processes. So breathing, heart rate, you know, I always say it's such a shame that subjects are alive because <laughs> we get all these problems. <laughs> like virtually everything that indicates somebody's alive, heart rate, breathing, movement is, is a big problem for us. We, we don't like it. So global signal was to, to address this. They thought it would, it would uh, mitigate some of the, uh, these physiological effects. And uh, another group came back, Kevin Murphy's group, and they said, yes, this, this does indeed remove certain artifacts, but it also seems to introduce false uh, or spurious negative correlations. So you still get your positive correlations in the same regions without signal regression, as you see in the bottom. But in the top, you also see this introduction of negative correlations where you didn't see them before. And they said these look like they're, they're spurious. Now, I want to say something in defense of global signal regression, in that um, if you look at other techniques to try to remove physiological processes, and we'll cover one in, in con later today called ANAT comp core, where you, you extract components from, say, white matter, uh, from CSF, from these regions that you know, you, you're, you're trying to basically you know, tease out of your data. Uh, you still see these negative correlations. So are they spurious? Well, that indicates you know, probably not. You're using another technique, which um, you know, according to the math the, that Murphy et al. pointed out, doesn't seem to, by necessity, introduce negative correlations. They said, no, we're just cleaning it up. We're using the most uh, advanced ways we know to, to clean up the signal. And afterwards, you're left with some negative correlations. Um, in the con toolbox, you do have the option to use global signal regression, but their ANAT comp core procedure kind of does the same thing conceptually. We're trying to remove things like heart rate, like breathing, it, assuming you didn't collect that as part of your, uh, part of your protocol. 
and then gets rid of it. And as you'll see, it shows you what the distribution of correlation is before and after. So every voxel, every other voxel, it shows the distribution. And invariably, it's almost always heavily skewed positive. After they do all their denoising, which does not necessarily include global signal regression, it's much more centered around zero. So you're going to get some negative, some positive. You know, this has been a whole debate over years, a lot of complicated stuff. I don't want to say that it's, you, know, you should or you shouldn't use it. Really, it's something to be aware of, something to study up more on. And then if you want to use it, you, know, it's, you can justify it. I'm not going to say it's wrong. Some, pe some people won't like it. I don't. <laughs> But you can, you know, if you decide that you'd like to. I, I just prefer to, you know, the, the equations they showed were pretty convincing that, yes, it's, it's going to, by definition, kind of, you know, on the face of it, artificially introduce shifts towards a negative correlation. Um, so I prefer to use this more ICA approach that we'll be using the contour box. Yeah. But, you know, people have very strong opinions both ways. Okay. Now, since I started talking about, you know, physiological regressors, this is something you may want to keep in mind for when you're designing your own uh, experiment. And I'll tell you, I've, I've been on a few different grant writing panels in my day. You know, groups of people get together, we write a grant. Has anybody written a grant here? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you'll, you'll find out eventually that you need to specify how much time you'll need for each scan. Right? You've got you to gotta come up with a budget. So certain, like, there's a rate per hour, so you say it's going to take one and a half, two hours per subject. And usually when you do all the calculations, you say, I need this many trials for this, I need this many trials for that. OK, I got all that. Uh, I still have 10 minutes left over. And so what always happens, without fail, is people say, well, let's just do a resting state scan or a you know, diffusion scan, something like that, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with it, right? The subject doesn't need to do anything, so it's, that's totally fine. But if you are going to do it, you may want to consider uh, you know, thinking a lot about how you're going to approach it. You don't just put them in there and then leave them. I mean, you need to prepare them a little bit. You need to think about how you're going to analyze it. So if you can, I do recommend including things like, uh, what's that thing that measures the, the pulse? The, something, oximeter, yeah, yeah. Oximeter, uh, they have a breathing belt for some, not everybody likes it, but you know, if they're cool with it, you can also measure the respiration. And as you'll see, if you include those regressors, you just look at what variance is explained by those regressors. Uh, say, look at cardiac. Where, where's the most loading for that regressor? Yeah, close to the brainstem where the, the arteries are, are coming through, right? And respiratory regressors, where do you see the most loading for that? More cortical, but specifically, like what part? Yeah, it's it's the edge of the brain because when they're breathing, right? You know, their brain goes up, down. So what you don't want to get caught with is, you know, when this is going on, that may seem to introduce correlations that aren't actually there. So if you remove that, you're going to get rid of that confound. And that comcore is going to try to do the same thing. But this is also a very good approach if you can if you can swing it. Uh, no, another thing I have written down: um, if you are ever going to be dealing with, say, children in particular, I used to work at Haskins. They did a bunch of uh, children's studies. For resting state, you, you know, you don't want them to fall asleep. You don't want them to be fidgeting around a lot. One paper that came out in, I think it was 2017, 2016. I can't remember the name. I'll find it during lunch. was about something called InScapes. So these are like 
abstract fractals, images that you kind of zone out and watch, <laughs> right? But it's not a movie. There's no narrative. There's no characters. And they've shown that you actually, if you have somebody do that compared to somebody who's doing a typical resting state scan, they're awake, not doing anything in particular, you still recover those typical networks, so default mode and so on. And you get better compliance, especially with children, because they're not doing anything, they're still awake, and it tends to keep them a little bit more compliant. So Inscapes, I-N-S-C-A-P-E-S. -E yeah, I invariably recommend eyes open. And just, because if they fall asleep, that's, that's a whole different, but, and you could tell them, close your eyes, but don't fall asleep. I mean, mm. while laying down, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Purring is a very generous <laughs> <laughs> word. Maybe we'll get to that point at some some point. In any case, the, you know these are these are things to really keep in mind because uh, we're going to be doing so much pre-processing, so much denoising. But I always tell people if if you you know prepare the subject, you do the mock scanner thing, you get them trained, you you do everything you can to make them comfortable and compliant as possible. You don't have to deal with so many of these headaches that we deal with later on, because if they move way too much, you can't you can't do anything. You really can't. Uh, so I, I really I really harp on that a lot. Okay, so a few things about functional connectivity applications, then I'll show you. Uh, brief demo. It's 10:43. Wow. Um, the way, th so some of the first applications of of looking at these resting state uh, networks, these resting state maps, is they would place seeds in regions that they would know were involved in uh, either certain certain cognitive processes or you know could reliably induce certain networks like the default mode network. And then they compared the two networks to each other, right? They're trying to use this. They're claiming you can use this as a, say, like a di diagnostic tool. Maybe somebody hasn't shown any behavioral symptoms yet, but this could indicate that they may develop problems in the future. So you know, again, not not a complicated idea. They're not doing anything. It's no task. You just classify them by different groups, and then you compare, uh, you know, different. Uh, different groups against each other for different networks. So default mode is it is it is it hyperactive, hypoactive in different areas? Same thing for bipolar, and if so, where? And pharmacologically, could you do anything that could possibly modulate the the activity in these regions? So that's that's one of the uh, the big. Uh, hey Jennifer, how you doing? Yeah. Uh, I haven't looked into it, but I'm sure I'm sure they have. Yeah. Yeah. But you can see the application and why it might be so popular, right? I mean, this this costs virtually nothing to do if you tag it on to the end of your scan, and you can see some reliable differences between the two. Uh, let's see here. You can also use this for, say. Uh, pre-surgical planning. So if somebody has a, a really massive tumor, they're not able to do, say, like a, a typical, say, motor task, something like that, you can still plant these seed regions in part of the network that you think is uh, you know, still involved, but maybe not affected by the tumor. And then try to use that to see what parts of cortex you may really want to preserve if they're going to be re rehabilitated later. You know, I, haven't, I haven't done anything with you know, patients who have tumors or any kind of intracortical stuff. But I'll, I'll tell you a story. There's a, a professor at Michigan I was talking to who does ECOG, electrocorticography, where they actually place the electrodes directly on the brain. So say somebody's, you know, going in for epilepsy surgery and, you know, you, you want to see where, where the, the, the biggest problems are. And he was showing me some slides, and he showed me a slide that had a recording from the, the thalamus where it's just pretty deep in your brain, right? And I said, how, like, how do you get a electrode in there? 
And he goes, oh yeah, most of those are actually accidents. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Not by him, but he got this from uh, a hospital. And he's like, yeah, sometimes they just go too far. And they just <laughs> yeah. So that's just one guy, it's just one story, but uh, <laughs> I was, and he just kind of brushed it off. He's like, yeah, just poke a little too far. Uh, anyway, and one of the last applications, something that we've been doing at Michigan, is uh, I think this is from uh, Thad Polk's lab, where you can look at connectivity uh, not only in a resting state context, but also a task context as well. And it's kind of hard to see the, the legend here, but they look at this thing called functional uh, de differentiation. So with younger subjects, you see some more differentiation in the networks between, say, you know, yeah, so younger, older subjects. And also, if you look at uh, connectivity between different regions within a category of stimulus versus between the category of stimulus, it seems that with older people, there is, uh, let's see if I'm reading this correctly, there is less connectivity between these regions within or yeah within a category as opposed to between a category so you can use this to again try to identify some kind of biomarker of uh, what might contribute to say cognitive impairments all right another two types of connectivity I want to briefly touch on because you can apply these in a, a task context and you can do this in con as well. Right. So we're mainly going to cover resting state connectivity but this is an option if you have some kind of task. Uh, this first one actually isn't in the con toolbox, the next one is. But you should be aware of this, it's called beta series correlation. Instead of simply taking one time course from one, one region, one time course from another region and correlating them, instead if somebody's doing a task you can deconvolve the HRF. You can do a separate beta estimate for each individual trial. So, you know, last time I was here, we talked about uh, when you estimate a parameter for a condition, you're estimating the average parameter or amplitude change for that condition across all the trials. For something like beta series, you can do something called individual modulation, where you do a separate estimate for each individual trial. You get an estimate of all the betas, so whatever, whatever the amplitudes are for, say, uh, you know, Q1, Q2, Q3, those are three individual trials of the Q condition. And then I take those three amplitudes that are estimated, daisy chain them together, create a time series, and then do that at each voxel and see where those correlate. So it's related to the actual time course, but it seems to be more appropriate for uh, uh, like a, a task context where you're seeing where the amplitude is correlated between different regions. Uh, I think you could do it in both, but it'd be, it'd be more typical in an event related. It wouldn't necessarily need to be large. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, how much power would you have to actually estimate it? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you need to make sure that your design is efficient, for sure. So you need to take into account, you know, how much jitter you need to get an accurate estimate mm -hmm. to decompose these two things together, even if there is overlap between them. Um, and basically, if you know, if you think that you have uh, good uh, power to detect the individual ones, then, you know, this is more valid. If there's a lot of correlation between the regressors, you know, it, it's, it's going to go down quite a bit. Yeah. It, uh, I haven't seen people do this too much lately. This was really popular back in the late 2000s. But it's not, I haven't seen it done that much recently. It's still around. And taking individual modulation is still useful to do. Uh, in some context. So just, just, to, just to be aware of it. The 
other type of connectivity is something called PPI or psychophysiological interaction. The people who developed AFNI, for whatever reason, they really don't like this word, and they prefer to call it context-dependent correlation. But it's, it's the same thing. When we talk about the psychological part of PPI, that's simply your uh, main effective task. When was the task on? When was the task off? And you can model this as a regressor. Right? So you know, it's pretty simple. We, we do that all the time. The physiological part of PPI is extracting the time series from your seed region. Right? So you have those two sources of variance. And then PPI is simply the product between those two things. Now, there are a couple of different ways to do this. Um, I don't want to get too much into it. Uh, basically, you know, one thing that I think they do this in SPM, if I recall correctly, you take the time series and you try to deconvolve it into individual uh, neural responses, like punctate bursts at specific times to reconstruct this time course. Whether that's actually valid is, is under debate. I don't really think it is that you can recover the actual neural firing because we're looking a few steps removed from that. But um, that is, uh, anyway, I don't want to get too much into that because we're, we're not going to be dealing with it that much. But the point is you have two sources of variance. You have your task, you have the time series. And the PPI is going to capture anything above and beyond those two sources of variance. So it's going to be, you know, you're trying to orthogonalize this to, uh, to those. Like remove all your sources of variance except for the PPI. What that means is you need to have a very, very strong PPI effect to actually detect it. Because think about it, you've removed effective task, which is what they're doing, and also the time series as well. So what the actual you know, parameter estimate for your PPI is probably not that big. You need to be very strong. And what this is, uh, let me back up a little bit. You, this shows where correlation differs between, say, your seed region and every other vox on the brain as a function of whether you're in one psychological state versus another. So if I'm in, uh, you know, task A, does my correlation between these two regions increase compared to task B, right? So if the two regions show connectivity regardless of task, you're not going to see a PPI effect, right? It needs to, to change noticeably as a result of whether you're in task one or task two. You can generalize this in something called GPPI, where you can extend this to however many tasks you have in, in, your, uh, in your experiment. It's seen as more valid. Uh, and this is an option in, in CON. So if you have, say, a task data set you want to do GPPI, let me know during the second half of tomorrow, and we'll, we'll try to set that up. That's not going to be my main focus. We're focusing mainly on resting state, using the CON toolbox, identifying networks, and taking the differences between them. But this is something else you, you should be aware of. OK. A couple caveats. Um, when I was helping write a grant last year, this was something that came up, which was how long of a scan do you need? This is out of Stephanie Noble, who is was part of uh, the constable group at Yale. And they do a lot of stuff on resting state. Uh, she showed that you know if you want high task or test retest reliability, so you you know you do resting state at time point one and time point two, and you want to say do a, a compared t test between them, you need a lot more time and a lot more scans than you probably think you need. So, how they define good, define excellent. You know you have to read the paper to find out what the cutoffs were. But just notice, you know, if you're doing just one uh, five-minute resting state scan, you're in the upper left corner, right? 
So it's pretty sobering because like I need what three, four, thirty minute. I mean, so again, you know, read the paper, make your own judgment. But these are what their simulations showed. So if you are really intent on doing a resting state analysis, some kind of experiment, you'll need to take this into consideration because I do think that it's going to probably catch on more, you know, especially with all the debates about power and everything. Oh, yeah, actually, no, I think they, they did this on Human Connectome Project okay. data. Yeah, sorry, no, it wasn't a simulation. Yeah. And the last caveat is how many scans can you get away with removing? All I can really say is it depends on your study goals and it depends on the population you're studying. I wish I could give you a hard cutoff, some objective measure that everybody agrees on. Right. If you're studying kids and you follow the same thresholds that people who are studying adults do, you're not going to have any data remaining. Right? That's just a fact. You know, if you have less than, say, 70% of your scans remaining, I mean, how much power are you really going to have? Right? You're, you're scrubbing out so many volumes, including so many additional regressors to get rid of those you're probably going to run through a lot of degrees of freedom really quickly. You add on top of that your motion regressors, uh, derivatives if you want, other things. You add in these uh, components that I'm talking about with an at comp core, and you're just going to exhaust everything. So, but you know, that being said, people who deal with kids, they need to make it a little bit more lenient. Um, yeah, so I'd say, you know, if you're removing more than 10, 15% consistently, that's probably a problem. If you're doing with a special population, all I can say is consult what the major groups have been doing because I, I can't give you a, a really informed recommendation on that. For typical people, 10%, 15%, that's the max I would recommend. Do you find yeah. that this is consistent? Because I know that the movement artifact is actually really a big issue for older adults as well. Yeah. See, I don't know because I don't deal with the special populations. Oh. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Do you do anything special besides restraining them a little bit? Uh, we also do the mock scanning. Okay. And train them a little bit. So. There you go. Yeah, if you tell them what it costs. Then really yeah, <laughs> especially older people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're thinking of a controllable motion or something like a temporal timer or? Um, Potentially, but I, I feel like that. A controllable motion, I think I have the same experience as the other in terms of being mm. trainable, but with the new people, you might have yeah. Yeah. some type of issues. So. Yeah. So good luck. <laughs> OK, I'm going to move on to a, a short demo to show you how connectivity used to be done before Con Toolbox. Uh, before that, just to get you prepared, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to show you like a very basic pre-processing uh, pipeline. I'll be picking a seed region to identify part of the default mode network, and then showing how that seed is correlated with the rest of the brain. Uh, another step, very common, is you know we get all these correlation values, right? So we get one R value for each voxel. Entire time series for one voxel, entire time series for another voxel, correlate them, get one value. Uh, then you run the statistical maps, or sorry, you convert that to a Z value using an arctan H transformation. It's not terribly complicated. And then because we assume that those are now more normally distributed, then we run the stat statistical test on those maps. And that's also a default in the con toolbox. So just sit back, relax. Next 10 minutes or so, I'm just going to show you how this would look like, kind of 
get your get your minds prepared for what we're going to be doing a little bit later. Can everybody see that okay? Do I need to increase it anymore? Okay. Uh, Amazon. Okay. I'm going to do this in AFNI because they have their own built-in pipeline for how they like people to do resting state. And you can do it too. It's up to you. Uh, you know, I think the Con Toolbox, they're much more focused on it, so they're, you know, they're applying the most advanced techniques. But this, this kind of shows you pretty simply uh, how it happens. Bless you. So notice, you know, with AFNI, you have a couple different things. You can do it in apply it to volume, apply a rest pipeline, and you'll see what this looks like when it generates the actual analysis script. So let me get my anatomical image. It does not have skull data sets. Okay, no stimulus timing because again, resting state, we have no onsets, don't need to worry about any of that, which is nice. Um, you'll notice that their uh, motion sensor limit is going to be 0.2 millimeters per TR. Okay, that's like an average millimeter. Think of frame-wise displacement, right? So that's pretty strict, right? Two tenths of a millimeter per TR, so TR to TR. If it's more than that, that thing gets scrubbed. And some people are even more severe with that. They say not only that one, but the one before and also the one after. Because who knows when exactly they moved, and you want to cover all your bases. I think that's a little bit overkill, but you can do what you want. And also notice uh, something we'll be talking about during con preprocessing is you know, if you select, I want to do a resting state analysis, it introduces this thing called a bandpass filter. Right? I'll be showing you an animation later what, what this looks like, but for now be aware that, uh, you know, we have these time series and we can, we can represent it as frequency components, right? So higher frequencies and also lower frequencies over time. With task data, you almost always want a high pass filter. What high pass means is you only let the higher frequencies through this filtering mechanism, you remove the lower frequencies. So those are things like drift. Those are things like, uh, say, breathing, you know, something that would take place every, I don't know, five, six, seven seconds or so. Um, maybe not that, actually. But anyway, uh, what happens here is they have a bandpass filter which restricts what frequencies you'll allow, right? So it has both high pass and low pass filtering. So it removes some of these higher frequency components. Some people have claimed that these higher frequency components uh, possibly could introduce some spurious correlations. Um, that's a little bit more flexible. I, I'll leave it up to you whether you even want to include it or not. Alfonso, the guy who created it, the defaults in con are to band pass. But even he says, I usually just remove the low pass filter. So that's up to you. Uh, motion derivatives, like I was talking about earlier, to account for more complex head motions. And then uh, the rest of this is just kind of some defaults I like. It's not too important. So we generate the script. Daphne's pretty, pretty neat that way. Uh, this thing takes a few minutes, and as it's going, I'll, I'll show you what's going on in there. Uh, in their script. It's a really long script, and like I said, a lot of their preprocessing, very similar, identical actually, to what you do with, with task preprocessing. You know, you do some uh, removal of scans that you think may have, say, intensity differences. So ones at the very beginning that you remove because they can just have a higher signal than the rest. Uh, you identify outliers. You can 
uh, for whatever reason, say that because there's a spike in motion, you can, you can account for that a couple different ways if you don't think it's due to motion. Uh, slice time and correction, which I'll discuss more at a later point, aligns everything. That does your motion correction. It, it warps it to a standardized space, in this case, M and I. And then a bunch of other stuff happens. These are details. Don't need to worry about too much. But when we get to actually running the model, here's something you'll need to know about. Okay, we're almost there. Almost there. If you've ever used AFNI, there's this thing called 3D Convolve, which takes the entire time series. If you give it onsets, it takes those and it says, okay, how can I recover this individual hemodynamic response to each condition to get an estimate, right? In this case, though, we don't have any tasks. We don't have any onsets, so we, we don't include that. So what actually does happen in this model? We regress out all these motion parameters. We also include this, this bandpass filter that was talked about earlier. Uh, we include some polynomials for very slow signal drift. And then, once we have that, we get this thing called an error time series. Okay, so here's this counterintuitive thing that I want everybody to, to understand. When you do this in a typical task uh, environment, the error time series is everything that you can't account for with your model, right? So you want to account for everything you possibly can with your model in a task. And then everything that's kind of left over, you don't really care about, right? You try to minimize the error as much as possible, for sure. But with, oh, I kind of overwrote that, just finished. But when we do resting state preprocessing, the error time series is actually exactly what we're interested in. Because we've regressed out in our model everything we think is a confound. So that error time series, unfortunately named in, in AFNI, but you get the concept, right? That is what we use for the correlation analysis. Okay. So, you know, if everything has been pre processed here, I'm going to get my script. Okay. I mentioned during the you know, what do we do for a functional data preprocessing? We do all those things to clean it up, everything like that. Then we need to pick a seed region. Think of it as a node. I want to get that into your head right now, plant the seed, <laughs> so to speak, because we're going to be applying this same idea, but to nodes when we get to these more complex networks. So this is very basic, but once you get this, you'll have the foundation to then uh, grasp the more complex things we do in the con toolbox. So don't worry about AFNI syntax. I'm just creating a seed at these MNI coordinates. I'm going to briefly look at it just to show you where it is and why I placed it where I did. AFNI is a really cute program. I like it a lot. You can submit your picture and it will show a random picture of a user at the start of and it's, it's adorable. I really like it. Okay, so everything's been normalized. Uh, let's see here. Oh, whoops. This PCC was my seed region. So everything in red is what I've identified as, as my seed. So anybody have a guess why I picked that particular region. It's the hub of the default mode network. Very good. And I, you know, I could base this on, say, you know, what some other paper reported. That's fine. But for me, I just thought, okay, based on this subject's individual anatomy, it looks like it's kind of in that region. If I plant a seed there, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get this default mode network. So, and I'm also just checking to make sure that the seed is where I thought it should be. Now, this error time series, I want to also show you. I want to show you the time series of it, right? So let's see here. OK, if I look at one of these 
forget about the TV white noise over there. I promise it makes sense. This is the time series after everything has been you know, cleaned up, filtered, right? And this is uh, a seed. This is one of the seed voxels within my, within my ROI. Um, when I do the seed analysis, I'm going to be averaging the time courses around all of these voxels to get an average time course. And then when I correlate it, I correlate that with every other voxel in the brain. So all I'm doing, I'm basically just doing pattern matching between this time series and say another voxel over here, another voxel over here, and saying, you know, do those two things match up? Uh, let's see if I, do I remember how to do this pick ideal? Yeah, ideal equals zero. Okay, so that's the seed region from right there. And then I say, go to another seed. I say, is this one correlated with that one? This one, uh, I mean, can't really tell that much. Probably not. But we have the computer to do it for it. But this conceptually is what it's doing. So every voxel says, correlate this one with this one. Just correlate a time series. Get a number. That's it. Insert that number in the voxel. Okay, so we have our seed. And then we're going to take that seed, we're going to average all the voxels within it, and dump it into this uh, time series course right here. So just like what I showed you with that AFNI viewer. Okay, so that's the average across all those voxels in the seed region. And then where the magic happens is this command 3D FIM plus every resting state program has something like this just to, to correlate everything. Not complicated, not sophisticated, but it automates everything. And notice, what? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, I'm just showing you how it used to be done. Um, yeah. <laughs> So we get this correlation map. Think of it as a statistical map. I'm going to overlay that here. OK, now for some reason it recognizes it as correlation. But you can see, obviously, within our seed region, that's the most intense. So there's the correlation values transform to uh, z scores, I believe. And then we see the most correlation with that with this more medial prefrontal area, more frontal pole area. Okay. So we get a map like that for our subjects. And what we would do if we wanted to do a group analysis, we just get one of these maps per subject and then do a statistical test on all of those. Okay. So any questions on this? Because this is the first, this is just the foundational step where you apply everything else to. Uh, I haven't done that. I don't know of a way to do that in AFNI. That sounds kind of more along the line of like a Granger causality, if I'm recalling correctly. Uh, that That's usually not seen as an appropriate analysis with fMRI data. I can't give you all, all the details, but it has to do with something about the temporal autocorrelation of the time series. But people used to do Granger series, uh, time series analyses, just like what you said, to look at the shift, I believe we have the temporal shift from one region to another, and try to infer causality from that. But there have been papers talking about what the problems with that are. Yeah. Okay. So it's been tried, but for some reason, it's not considered valid okay. by the fMRI community. I guess I have one other follow-up, too. The low yeah. pass you had on there was really low, the, the 0.1 hertz. So you're yeah. Right. Um, is this really like nothing more than 10 seconds to just thought to be meaningful? Or, or maybe even with like the low loss of a filter up to like 15 seconds? 
Yeah. Yeah, that's basically what it's going to do. And I, I can show you what that looks like in the um, in the design matrix. So this is everything that's been filtered out, right? So th this may look totally weird to you. It makes sense to me, but, you know. Uh, hang in. You'll drink the Kool-Aid, and eventually you'll, like, under, you'll see patterns, you know, where there's this total, total noise to somebody else. Uh, but what happens here, t to flesh this out a little bit, um, these are your polynomials on the left here, right? So anything that's like a, a linear trend, a quadratic trend across the entire time series. You have your motion regressors. You have their derivatives here. And then, because we remember we had a, a bandpass filter, these are the very slow uh, frequencies. Then there's a, a gap here. Then you have a lot higher frequencies here. Um, so basically, it's leaving out anything that wasn't accounted for here. Obviously, these are you know discrete regressors. It's not continuous, but it's their best estimate of you know what they're they're trying to remove. So anything that basically looks like one of these patterns is going to be removed from from the time series yeah any other questions Yeah, this is so. I didn't want everybody to, to download AFNI because th that's not the focus. Um, but AFNI does, they, they have this single subject analysis GUI, which, yeah, it, it's based on Python and it generates your entire processing script. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, actually, uh, the course I taught at Milwaukee a couple weeks ago, we, we used that. And I can give you the link to the data we used, because it's a really simple flanker task, like incongruent, congruent, same thing we used, actually. And yeah. Yep. OK, let's take a, a five-minute break. I, I was going to help. You had something you needed to? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll share that with you. OK, yeah. OK, but yeah, let's just take five minutes and meet back at 11.25.